Hi, my name is Mike Aben, and welcome to episode 19 of my beta campaign. The highlight for this episode is definitely going to be my first space shuttle of this campaign. So, uh, and I'll take the time as well to talk a little bit about space shuttle design and how I like to put them together because definitely, I think as far as builds go, space shuttles are one of the most challenging things uh, to build in Kerbal Space Program. Uh, but before we get into all of that, uh, we have Looney out here in the Alhazen once again. Again, this is such a cheap, well not cheap, it's a free mission uh, to go around the Kerbal Space Center and to uh, collect science. So this, that's all this is about. And if you recall the last time Looney uh, took this thing out, she kind of, uh, well, she broke it, didn't she? She broke it on the... Um, on the crawlway out towards the launch pad. So now she's out there on a second uh, second try. You know, Bob was giving her the gears about a little bit. He was like going, you know, I, I, I drove that thing two or three times. I never broke it, but uh, here we go again. But unfortunately, yeah, okay. Well, you know, this prompted me finally to decide I need to design this and give this thing a little bit more ground clearance. You know, this isn't Looney's fault. Uh, you know, this is the designer's fault, and that's clearly me. While a new Alhazen was being built, I thought I would show you this. Uh, you know, sometimes I think I create the impression that my vessels come right out of the box all ready to go. And of course, I go through design and uh, phases just like everybody else does. So I, I thought I would show you this. These, this is the Kerpolo. And uh, I, this is, I'm going, this one went through quite a few iterations. So I just want to show you uh, a number of things that ended up happening. So first of all, yeah, there's this. Uh, yeah, that's an obvious staging issue. And then, uh, so that, that finally, then on the next iteration, I finally did get it off the pad, and uh, I can see that there's a certain amount of wobbling going on, so I'll have to uh, look at the strutting and try and see if I can correct for that. But the real issue that I was running into was with detaching these liquid fuel boosters. And you can see what happens here. The separatrons just, they don't stay attached. They just go flying off, and then the boosters fall down, and yeah, that's not good. I can't, I can't leave that like that. Um, and this seems to be... I think a bit of a glitch because I really had issues uh, trying to get this to fix. So here's here's another go with the liquid fuel boosters, and again the same thing. And no matter what I did, those separatrons just kept sailing off. I kept trying different separatrons, tried strutting the separatrons down, tried reducing the thrust on the separatrons, and then I did a little bit of reading, and I found out that yeah, this seems to be an issue that actually has to do somehow with the aerodynamics of the decoupler. So, uh, you know, this is a bit of a preview, I suppose, of what you will see coming up in a future episode, and you'll see then how I ended up fixing this problem. A few days later, the new Alhazen is all set with its superior ground clearance. Yeah, this is something I should have done a long time ago, so no longer do I have any issues with uh, the bottom scraping when I go over these hills. Uh, it doesn't get itself stuck. It doesn't have things blow up anymore. Looney's feeling a lot better, that's for sure. And uh, yeah, so anyway, this is the same old mission. Drive around KSC, keep uh, scooping up science from these biomes in this free mission. But I think that's enough prelude. I think it's time to start talking about shuttles. And before we actually go straight to the mission, I thought it would be worthwhile to spend a little bit of time just talking about shuttle design because it is definitely bit more challenging than anything we've done so far. All right, let's talk about shuttles. So this is my shuttles. This is the Kayam, uh, a simple shuttle is the, uh, the idea here. Um, and when you start designing shuttles, it is a completely different ball game. You got to between planes and rockets and not surprisingly, you got to think of both things as being together. So what I'm going to start off with is let's ditch the whole booster part of it here. There we go. Let's just get rid of that and get rid of this. And let's just talk about the plane part because you still, okay, there we go. And we'll think about planes. So with planes, of course, what you want to have is the center of mass a little bit ahead of the center of lift. And you can probably barely see it, but the center of lift is there, but it is inside the center of mass. So you might go, well, what, isn't that going to be a problem? Well, no, not really because, um, this thing will never take off from uh, the runway. It's going to take off via the rocket. So I only have to think about what are its aerodynamics properties going to be like on its descent, on its re-entry. And what I got set up here, the way this is set up, is all the liquid fuel is in this 
back part right here. So when it comes back, that liquid fuel is going to be quite a bit less. And you can see as the fuel goes down, that center of mass starts to go up. So that's what I was sort of thinking about is where will the center of mass be, you know, when the thing is doesn't have much fuel left in it because that's what it's going to be like when it comes back. And I can always, you know, dump some fuel. You can use um tack fuel balancer to dump some fuel to play around with that center of mass. The other thing I have here is the RCS fuel I put way up at the front. So that's where the monopropellant is. And I actually have two things that can hold monopropellant. The other thing that can hold monopropellant is this cargo bay. It has monopropellant, but I have it empty. And the reason why I did that is so that if I wanted to play some more with the center of mass, let's say I found out that my plane was too nose heavy, I could take some of the monopropellant from the front and pump it to this empty tank here. So I have some ability to adjust the position of the center of mass. So that's a good thing. Let's talk a little bit about the plane in general. Uh, the plane can carry up to six Kerbals. It's got a cockpit too. This is the same cockpit that's on the um, the Archimedes, right? So it's the same cockpit as that. But it's also got this fuel tank back here. And so the fuel tank can house up to four Kerbals. It's also got itself a cargo bay, which I can open up here. So you can see inside, there's the cargo bay. Let's get rid of the mass and the lift. And all that's in the cargo bay, I hid some, some batteries and... and things and I got some life support in there as well and I do have this docking port that I put on a little bit of a piston so I can actually push it up a little bit so that's obviously for docking let's put that back down and if I wanted to let's turn that off close this if I wanted to I could easily reconfigure this to be a cargo carrier because this guy's two meters long the cargo uh, the crew tank and this is two meters long and I do have if I go over I think it's in the aerodynamics I'm not sure I do have maybe not maybe it's under structural a four meter cargo bay that I could or a five meter cargo bay I could take that out take out this docking port and this uh, crew tank and replace it with this and this thing can then carry uh, cargo small small satellites it's not a very big craft um, but I'm not going to do that because quite frankly, it's kind of a waste of funds. I know, I know <laughs> there's a reason why if you look at what SpaceX is doing and do it and looking at the plans of, of Boeing and, and, and all of that, there's a reason why they're not building space shuttles. It's expensive. It is way cheaper to launch cargo into space using just rockets, especially if you're going to recover your spent stages like I do. Um, the shuttles... Even for crewed missions, the shuttles are questionable as far as their economic uh, viability goes. But let's face it, they're, they're, they're pretty cool. Um, so we do want it. So anyway, there's the shuttle part. So let's uh, get rid of this and get the rocket back. And what I'll do is I'll just load the rocket. And we'll talk about design of the boosters. Where are we here? There it is. All right, so here's our rocket back. Now that's the whole thing assembled. So now we got to think about this thing launching. And the designing this is a lot trickier than designing regular rockets. And the reason is is because of the asymmetry of it, right? Usually when you build rockets, you have everything nice and symmetrical so that you know that the center of thrust and the center of mass will line up. And here you're going to have to do some tweaking around to get the center of mass and the center of thrust to line up. Now, one of the things, and by the way, you can't ignore even the center of lift. You kind of want that in the same ballpark, but you can see you can get away with it being a little bit away. Let's take that out. Here I want to concentrate on center of mass and center of lift. So I've got the center of lift, thrust roughly lined up. You can actually see the center of thrust is a little bit more towards the shuttle, towards the center of the vehicle than the center of mass. But I'll explain why I did that. But how I accomplished that is, well, one thing I did, and the purists will, will not like what I did here, is I put an engine on the bottom of the liquid fuel tank. So this is really a liquid fuel booster right now in the middle. Um, the purists, because the space shuttle didn't have that engine, would, would want this. So if you notice when I take that thing off that the center of lift comes way more this way right towards towards be balanced between these two engines here so what I want this would not fly straight at all this thing would want to pitch 
forward because the thrust is so far to the right here than the center of mass. The way the space shuttle accomplishes this task of lining up the center of thrust with the center of mass is, you can use these tools here, is they take these engines and they rotate them. Can I do it? There it goes, this way. Okay, that's pretty good. And you actually want to get, so this vector here, you want that to line up with the mass. Now, the issue with this, this configuration is ridiculous, to be honest. You would want to tweak around with this a little bit more. But this thing will actually at least fly for a little while. But it's not going to fly straight up, is it? It's going to fly off on an angle going this way. And if you look carefully at space shuttle launches, you will see when it takes off, it does fly up on an angle. But the issue is, is as these... As these boosters drain, let's imagine that the boosters now are gone. Let's say the boost. Whoops. Let's say the boosters got used up. Well, the boosters. Let's let's actually drain the fuel out of the boosters. That's what we'll do. So imagine the boosters draining. Watch what the center of mass does. It starts moving up, but it's also moving closer to the shuttle itself. Okay. And so as that happens, you want this center. You want these two to still line up. Let's now imagine that the boosters are now gone. There's the SRBs are now gone. Now the center of mass is moved in further as well. And now this fuel tank is going to start getting used. Where's my fuel? There we go. So imagine this fuel is being used. And look what's happening to the center of mass. It's moving towards the shuttle. right? Because now the, sh the shuttle is taking up the bulk of the mass. The way the space shuttle does deals with this is that these engines are gimbaled on the space shuttle so that these will continually, you can turn so that it'll keep it straight up. We don't have the ability to do that in flight, so that's one thing you can't do. The way a lot of people fix this issue is they will make this not one single tank like I have here, but have like a number of tanks in here, and then they will pump fuel back and forth to move that center of mass up and down so that it stays roughly in line with the center of thrust. Uh, I that And that works perfectly fine. That's what the purists like to do. And they'll get a shuttle that looks very much like the real space shuttle used to look. And uh, they'll get something that's, that's, that's pretty nice. But let's go over, or they'll get something that'll fly. But I personally don't like doing that because moving all the, I don't know, I find it a pain to, to move fuel back and forth. Even though I, I understand the, the purity of it, I don't want to do all that in flight. I just want this thing to fly and go. So let's talk about what I do with my shuttle. So we'll go back to the original again. So here's my, here's the original back again. Let's put the center of thrust and the center of mass up there. And you can see my center of thrust is a little bit towards the shuttle, not much. It's, it's lined up enough that actually this will fly straight. The reaction wheels are enough to keep this thing flying straight when it's only off by this much. So I accomplished that by putting an engine on the bottom of here. And I also tweaked the thrust on all of these. All of these have their thrust tweaked so that uh, everything stays balanced. So I'm playing around with the thrust. Um, I also have to pay, pay attention as well to what the thrust and weight ratio is, of course, while I'm doing that, because I still want this thing to go up the way it's supposed to. But what ends up happening with me is as the solid, let's start draining the fuel from these solid boosters, because that'll drain first. You can see that center of mass is moving inbound. But you can see because this was already more in, it's actually getting closer to flying straight. So that's pretty good. Um, so far, it would still fly straight without any additional assistance. And then, of course, we lose the boosters. They come off. Let's actually lose these things, too. Because they obviously wouldn't be there while you're flying. Okay. And now the center of mass, and these would be gone, too. Uh-oh. Excuse me. I just grabbed the wrong thing. I meant to grab the decoupler there. Let's get rid of that. Oh, I got it. Okay. Uh, and this thing would still, it would, it would be wanting to pitch forward, but uh, it would still be, eh, it might be getting questionable now whether what it wants to do. But then, of course, it's going to start draining this fuel, and now the center of mass is moving by quite a lot. And by this point, as that tank gets empty, this would be off by so much that this thing's going to want to pitch up dramatically. So this is what I do at this point. Once I lose the boosters, I turn on the RCS. And I have these RCS thrusters on the plane. When you put RCS thrusters on the plane, these are for maneuvering. Again, remember the idea with RCS thrusters is to put them 
far away from the center of mass of the plane. So that's why I have them on the end of the wing tips, up here at the top of the nose cone. I also have some down here by the engines, right? So that'll help. So that will help a little bit, but it won't be quite enough. The other thing I have on this tank is right in here, I gotta zoom in, I have these uh, Werner engines. Okay, can I move this way? I don't want to let me move that way. Okay, anyway, you can see them. They're, I got these Werner engines. I got a pair of them right here. They're not symmetrical. There's none on the other side because I know right now that this thing's going to want to pitch up. So I have these Werner engines which work as RCS thrusters, a reaction control system thrusters, but they're liquid fueled. So they're draining the fuel from the tank here as well, and they provide adequate thrust, in fact, more than enough thrust to keep this thing still flying straight. Okay, so this thing will still fly straight once I turn on the RCS. The other thing you want to do with the uh, fuel line, or with the fuel, is you want to have a fuel line going from this liquid fuel tank to your space shuttle so that these engines will be running off the liquid fuel in here. And as well, the RCS that's running will be draining not from the RCS that's in the nose cone, but will be draining from an RCS tank. I think this one is, yeah, that one's an RCS tank. So the RCS that it uses during launch up until I get rid of this liquid fuel booster um, will be all draining from this tank. So when I detach the big tank and it's just a shuttle, so it's just this, this thing will be completely full. This tank here will be full and this tank here will be full of uh, monopropellant. All right, now it's time to see this thing go. Now the original mission plan was this, this mission that came with the Mission Controller 2 mod that had uh, this mission to take two civilians up to uh, into low carbon orbit and leave them up there for a few days. So what you had to do is you had to create a rocket, leave a couple of empty seats that were supposed to be for the civilians and um, and just leave it up there for a little while, but that contract seems to have disappeared. And in fact, when I went and looked into it, I found out that I had fulfilled it without realizing that I had fulfilled it. So I'm like, oh, well, I got this thing on the pad. It would seem kind of a waste just to not use it. So I decided to go with the contract. Um, the, I had a contract to uh, do a crew transfer with the Hipparchus station, which is nowhere near. Those guys haven't been up there enough. They've only been up there for like 25, 30 days or something like that. So so it wasn't time to rotate them out there yet, but I figured, well, I got this thing on the pad, so I might as well do it. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to do a crew rotation. And you can see our crew. We got our pilot, Robble, our engineer, Genimal, and our scientist, Looney. And these three were picked because these are my three Kerbals that have yet to be in space. You can also see that I'm still using that KOS launch program. I have not modified this program at all, ever. It's always been the same launch program for all of my launches. And that's the other reason why I like to build my shuttles this way, so that uh, I don't have to change this program and I can just keep using it. So, Omar Khayyam, Omar Khayyam, for whom this vessel has been named after, was an 11th century Persian mathematician and astronomer. Uh, his contributions to mathematics in particular were, were very significant. Uh, he extended upon Euclid's uh, quintessential work, Elements, which really formed the uh, foundations of geometry. In fact, it was virtually a textbook for, for most of its lifetime. Um, and uh, what, what, what Kayan uh, did was he examined in more detail the parallel lines postulate that was in Euclid's elements and really essentially laid down the foundation of what would later become non-Euclidean geometry. He also wrote about Pascal's triangle six centuries before Blaise Pascal actually came around and he laid down important works in algebra laying down the uh, foundations of that particular distance. As an astronomer, there is some evidence that he was also a proponent of a heliocentric model for the solar system. As you can see, I just turned on the RCS for the first time in preparation for the SRB separation. There they go. That went well. So, uh, yeah, I think what I'll do is I'll cut to the higher part of this orbit. And then you can see here that the RCS is now beginning to actually have to work a little bit to keep this vessel uh, tracking well. And that the, the Werner engines are also starting to kick in a little bit. So there we have main engine cutoff. All right, so now we just have to coast on to 
the top of our apoapsis and perform our circularization burn. Again, I want the liquid fuel booster to end up deorbiting again, so I will detach once my periapsis is in around 50 kilometers or so. So we detach, and then all we have to do is finish off our circularization with the orbiter, and everything is good and ready for our rendezvous. Well, you've certainly seen me do enough rendezvous of late, so uh, we'll just cut right to the docking here. So we'll, we'll open up our cargo bay to expose our docking port, push it out with some Inferno Robotics, get it looking sort of nice, and then we'll, uh, we'll just uh, select the docking port and control from there. We already have the right dock, docking port selected on the space station, so then it's just a matter of bringing it in and docking. And after taking in the view from inside the crew can of the Kayam, it's time to start doing the crew transfers. So, Robble and General and Looney all get transferred into the space station, into the Hipparchus, and uh, Tom Plock and Rodbart and Bill get transferred into the Kayam to get prepared to get on out of here and get do the descent back home. So we undock as we normally do, but uh, what the heck is that? That is a docking port. And I can see the Infernal Robotics piston still attached to it. So that obviously came off the Kayam. So Kayam now has no docking port. Well, I guess that's not a big deal because I don't plan on docking with it. And, uh, you know, all I got to do is descend and bring it down. But if you notice what's happening with the camera, I'm not doing that. The camera is moving on its own. It seems to be stuck on the center of mass between the, the, the orbiter and that docking port. It still seems to be thinking that the docking port is part of the orbiter and the camera keeps moving towards where the center of mass is and that docking port is of course moving away. Yeah, switching the camera view didn't fix that. So yeah, that's a little bit spooky. So the next thing I tried to do is I try because I can't I can't fly it like this obviously. So then I tried to um, go back to the uh, space center and then come back to here and see if that fixed that, which it did not. And then I figured, well, I guess I'll just have to fly this thing home um, from the cockpit view. That's that'll be fun. That'll be a good challenge. So uh, I couldn't see where the space station was out the windows or pick it up on any of the external cameras. So I had no idea which direction the space station was. So I thought the best thing to do would be to play around with the targeting computer here and select the space station as a target. And then that way the target icon will come on my nav ball and then I can point the other way and then that way I can make sure that I at least won't fly straight into the space station. That would be a bad thing to do. But it was when I began to try to adjust the attitude of the spacecraft that I realized that my problems were bigger than I thought. Uh, I know you can't tell here but I am trying to turn the spacecraft and the spacecraft is locked in its position. I can't adjust its attitude at all. Now I know the reaction wheels are working, that's not a problem. And even if I put on the RCS it still won't turn the ship. And in fact here you can tell, uh, you can see the RCS firing and the ship won't, won't change its attitude. So well, clearly, this is a problem. I mean, I can't fly this thing at all now, so the only thing I can think of doing was abandoning ship. So, yeah, uh, Tom Plock and Rodbart and Bill, yeah, we got to get you back to the space station. So, thankfully, the space station wasn't too far away, so it wasn't too far of a fly to get back over there. So, with all of my Kerbals safely stowed away in the space station, I thought I would give one more thing a try. I saved my game quit, restarted my computer, and then obviously restarted KSP again in some desperate attempt that maybe somehow this might fix the glitch that happened. So once that was all accomplished, it was time to send Tom Plock back out to the Kayam to see if perhaps it's working now. And it was while Tom Plock was on his way out there that things got truly scary. Yeah, okay, now I'm scared. And the moment that happened, my frame rate took a dive as well. So something really bad is going on right now. Thank goodness I did not have any Kerbals in that sp in, in the, uh, in the uh, orbiter there. So yeah, I got Tom Plock back as quickly as I could back to the space station. Uh, checking in the tracking station verified the fact that the Kayam was now 
gone. It was it 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 it, it disappeared like a ghost, like it never existed before. Uh, so. Yeah, I got my six Kerbals now, and, well, at the very least, they seem to be not too upset about their situation. Yeah, I think the, 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 maybe they're planning on having a party. Uh, checking the food supply, it certainly looks like they got enough food and life support to last them for quite some time. But I think that's going to be drawing this episode to a close. And in the meantime, I'll think about what I'm going to be doing about this situation. So, hope to see you then.